And we are live. All right, fantastic. Uh, welcome everyone to the final session of All Systems Nominal Mercenaries, our now three-part series uh, to tie up the little uh, excursion that our mercenary corps has been uh, engaged on on the planet of Eritan IV. Uh, but I'd like to get everyone back up to speed and have everyone introduce their characters. And since Louise is finishing up his meal, let's start with Rich. Tell us a little bit about your pilot the mecha that they are operating, and what they want to do today. I am playing Lieutenant Ishikawa. Uh, Lieutenant Ishikawa is a long-term corpse military, and he actually was a battle fleet guy for quite a while, but had designs around getting in a mech and realized the only way he was going to make that happen was to muster out and form a company. And so this Lance is a company that he started up, which is why he's the guy who's bossing people around. Um, he, his mecha model is the Mega Cycle 404, uh, manufactured by Ares Arms. And it is is uh, basically a little giant unicycle with a fake pilot on top and a rail gun. So in the original rules, it was a really poorly designed mech by me, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're drifting the rules. So maybe I won't suck as bad. <laughs> we'll see if I run out of guns in the first round. <laughs> uh, Ishikawa really uh, last session, there was a, uh, these Aries were, fighting a proxy war, which he's not exactly opposed to, but he was doing it through farmers who want to protect their homeland, and he has a strong objection to that. So he really wants to punch Ares in the mouth with guns. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that a little bit more. So um, I'm, I'm trying to fully remember the details here, but I know that a lot of this conflict has been going on. Again, all these like a corporations start to blend and look like one another after a while. But you've been hired by the Mirai Symposium, right? And they've been having this sort of spat with the Apex conglomerate, right? So your Ishikawa has an issue with the fact that Apex has been hiring these miners to sort of fill in as additional uh, security forces. Is that right? Yeah, sorry. It's been a couple weeks. I mixed up Apex and, and Ares. I apologize. Yes, he wants to punch Apex in the mouth. Ares, he just, you know, he wants to keep them on the good side so they can buy aftermarket parts for his uh, mega cycle. Right. And I wanted to clarify that because if I, if I remember correctly, Ishikawa once was a soldier in the Ares corporations. Yeah, yeah. Military. Yeah, he was. He, he, he was Ares Arms uh, corporate soldier, yeah. So this is less of a daddy issue fight and more of a I want to be the good guy for once fight. Yeah, yeah, totally. Good guy for once sounds uh, like a great way to put it. Okay, I like that. Um, and we had another uh, twist in this issue was that some of the Mirai forces had actually, uh, I forgot the, the term that was used, but basically had, had abandoned their posts working for Mirai and had instead started working with these, this rebel faction who we believe was also being funded by Apex. Are we on the same page with that? Because I think that was something that, that Dell kind of provided uh, with his description. Am I, Darren, do you have any memories of this? Am I getting it yeah, wrong? Yeah, that, that sounds correct. Or maybe not that they were, they were being like, forced to fight against them or something like that. So we were hired to take them out under the presupposition that they were like a military force when in fact they were just farmers. Right. Something like that. Does that sound right? I can work with that. That's that's okay. very easy to work with. Um, and while we have you on camera, Darren, why don't you tell us a little bit about your pilot and their mecha? Okay. And, and maybe a little mission. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my character's name is Hafta. Um, <clears throat> Hafta uh, is from the Longinus Limited Arcology, and that's who he stole his mech from. Um, his mech's name is Melior, and Longinus's designs are this sort of like 
organic focus. So um, the Melior is structured as like a human and it has these sort of like systems and parts that are like um, maybe more flesh and organ like than metal and uh, not organ <laughs> like. Um, so yeah, it's sort of like prototypey in that way in this world maybe. Um, yeah, and ha Hafta um, was supposed to be this like pilot through this program, and he probably could have done it, but he said fuck that, and he like uh, pursued a life of crime and ran off, and then <laughs> he's like joined up with Lieutenant Ishikawa because uh, there's like better protection <laughs> than him just being alone. <laughs> and I think um, the two weeks ago it started like a hack with. Um, I can't remember David's character's name. Was that Dell? No. Knox, I believe. Was yeah, Knox. Yeah, that's right, Knox. With Knox. And um, so I don't want to drag that through because Knox isn't here. But uh, the goal there was to like screw over. Um, oh, I've forgotten all the names. Administrator Walker, right? Walker, yeah. I was like something with a W. Administrator Walker. Um, so yeah, I think I maybe just want to have like. Uh, I want to have like the full heist scene or like the heist movie moment where it's like, and here's how the plan worked out, and here's how Administrator Walker screwed over. <laughs> that would be my ideal. That sort of uh, epilogue, epilogue moment. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'll definitely make sure that we we, we shoot to have time for epilogues because I love mm -hmm. epilogues too. Perfect. So just out of curiosity, half does um, issues with Walker. Do they lie from a place of personal slight, or is it a similar moral or ethical motivation? No, like I, I think no, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Hafta is still young, uh, like a young man, so I think he's still just rebelling against authority for like rebellion's sake. Um, so he just hasn't had that encounter yet. That's gonna like bite him in the ass. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Well, I think that that kind of is a good place to go to Kayo then, as someone who's probably sort of in between those two ends of the pendulum, so to speak, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about Kayo and, and uh, his background? Sure. So Kayo is from, uh, uh, and you have to apologize because I'm really like hating capitalism these days, so I, I built like this little paradise that I wish it was real. It's like an anarcho-communist community where everybody pitches in and they share everything they make with the community so they can live outside of the... Because we, we establish kind of vaguely that the corporations own planets and they own lots of land and people usually live under the corporations as if they were government. So this right. community exists outside of that. It's not fancy, but it's like you're not bound to any companies and people who can't work anymore get taken care of by people who can. And that's where he comes in, because they have this collective of engineers and inventors that pick up scrap parts from destroyed mechas and build new mechas out of them, so people can work as mercenaries for the community and earn money. And uh, Kayo was a very strong pilot from a young age, so he was interested with one of those mechas. It's called the uh, Bizoro model. It's a plan, a plan on the Brazilian word for beetle. And uh, it basically looks like a, like a big Hercules beetle, like the humanoid shaped. It's a pokey, resistant mecha. They build them to last, not to, to be fancy. And uh, he's a very idealistic guy. He believes that there's a way out of this very oppressive system that people find themselves in, where they're hired like as basically cannon fodder for companies to battle against each other for profit. But he doesn't really see the repercussions of what he's doing as a mercenary. Like, he's just empowering the company to keep doing what they're doing and supporting a very small corner of the galaxy while ignoring the overall picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this last encounter, I'm going to, like, justify it in my head that he was present for everything that happened, the fight with the farmers and everything. And what happened was he likes following orders. He respects the chain of command too much, so he didn't question anything while they were going about the mission. He just like delegated his moral code to Ishikawa, trusting him not to lead him astray, and then realized he was involved in the like killing a bunch of farmers. We we did kill them, right? 
we had we had one uh, pilot who was who was killed, and that's when we realized um, that these these people were right. So okay. now one is enough. One is plenty to send spiraling. Yeah, and I think if if I'm honest, I'm, I'm I could be misremembering this as well, but I believe that I described that that, that pilot who had uh, died during the combat that they had a pair of dog tags that um, indicated that they had worked for Mirai. So the person who died was one of these people from Mirai, but it was a you were able to discern from um, the, the make and model of these mecha from the way that they've been customized, painted, the, the operational tactics of their unit, that this was not a professional military fighting force. Right. Okay, I get it. So that was made sort of clear. Um, and that led to David's character, Knox, having some of these sort of uh, flashbacks from uh, their wife and, and things like that. So there's still, <laughs> you know, it was, it was still a painful death that we, that we all witnessed. But um, it was technically from someone who had worked for Mirai as a security personnel. Okay. So if that soothes your conscience at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be as shaken about it, but it's, it's not going to be happy about it either. I think it's going to go on the righteous path and just be 100% on board with Ichikawa in wanting to beat up this, this other company for goading poor people into fighting their fights for what I assume to be zero to little compensation. Well, I think a great scene for us to have then would basically be the war room scene. Right. Mm -hmm. This is probably going to be Ishikawa sort of laying out the lay of the land here and his ideas about taking this place down. So um, I will say I have an image in the, the character sheet here, but it kind of got shrunk pretty small. So we should probably just follow the link <laughs> to see it full size. Um, and maybe I can share it on the screen here too this is basically what the apex headquarters on the planet is going to look like here uh let's see what this looks like oh wow that's so cool how do i share my screen again it's been a while uh the green um Two screen dots. with the arrow point from left to right on the uh, left hand sidebar Okay. Yeah, there's our fellow right there. Sweet. So as you can see, we have this sort of orange core down here is actually one of the like mining uh, machines, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but then we have these multiple levels um, of offices and and. Uh, cubicles, probably some habitation pods. Let your let your mind wander, you know, let your <laughs> let your imagination run free on what some of those things might include. Um, but what I'm thinking here is that primarily I want this scene to give everyone a chance to say how they feel about the mission and what they're hoping to accomplish through it, right? And then we can kind of work out the tactical details and, and all that good stuff a little bit later, right? Um, yeah, do we need any more kind of foundation to really make this scene shine? Anyone feeling like they need a bit more of a jumping off point? Are we going to be, is it the three of us, or are we meeting with Administrator Walker? Right. So we've had it sounds like we've had our meeting with Walker and Ishikawa has has made his plans clear to her. Yeah, this right. is this is you telling everyone the deal, right? Cool. Okay, I think that works for me. Cause we before just to like recap for myself and I can like mm -hmm. talk it out. Because <laughs> before we said that like um uh, we're not going to endanger these farmers we need to like end this now if you're gonna if we're gonna keep working for you otherwise we're done 
as what we said to Minister Walker, right? It's everyone. That everyone that sounds right to everybody. <laughs> That's what I remember. Yes, and I believe that she offered additional payment if you can do it without her getting blamed for it. Oh yeah. Okay. So I imagine that would look like basically you're getting your rate from your mercenary corps, you're getting your cut, but then you're getting a, a she's matching that to your private accounts. Cool. And she had suggested that you could maybe get some of these rebels on board to help you out. Oh, yes, okay. But that might involve okay. dirtying yeah. the hands of more innocent right. proletariats, right? So, Okay, yeah, I'm good. I'm ready to jump in. I'm sure I have to have some opinions. So let's talk about what this looks like a little bit, What what this room would look like on your mobile operating center, which we've kind of established as being like a giant uh, semi-truck trailer, right? That's sort of been kitted out and, and modulated to allow for different functions and, and, and rooms for your, for this small portion of the mercenary corps who's doing this mission, right? So we have one section dedicated to a hangar, do we have a war room, do you think, Ishikawa, or are you having to make do with another space? Uh, this is our own. This is our own. I think right. maybe we have a war room slash conference room slash flip it over. It's a pool table kind of thing. Yeah. So in this in this <laughs> conference room slash you know break room that you probably have to make do with, um, how has your mercenary core, um, like? How have they celebrated past victories? How do they showcase that in this room? Um, I, th I think we have some screen caps on the wall from different shots, kind of like in uh, in a video game where you might like photo opportunity or you screen cap a particular moment. We video capture our stuff for review and it makes them go through like VR debrief so like you, you should have went left here that that kind of penny any shit that you would do but he also screen caps like the beautiful moments of this is when you blew up this drop ship and that kind of stuff and so they're like little hollows of those you got your, your play of the games right <laughs> totally play the game do this so this so yes so let's just go in a circle here ishikawa what is what was one of um half does plays of the game oh um hold on let me look at half does armament to make sure that this would fly oh uh, have to have to have to over here i got a little hand blasties and shields and uh a two-handed weapon what is that weapon look like the two I got, weapon? I got my little hand blast and my two-handed weapon lets me oh, right. I can, like oh right like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there is a picture of from Ishikawa's point of view. So there's a little bit of fuzz around because it was a long, like chuk, 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 several times uh, multiply vision of Hafta in suit, like doing a double palm fist to the face of what effectively is a battle hammer mech, like a you know 150 tonner. And yes, we also have air hockey. It's like you flip this pool table, you flip again, it's air hockey, you flip again, it's a conference table. It's crazy. I don't know how they make that technology work. Um, but but yeah, that's what it is. Like two fists to the face fury is what the subtitle says underneath. Very cool. Hafta, what is uh what was one of Kayo's play of the games? Kayo's play of the games for Oh my god, a character sheet. I'm trying to think. Were you with us in the first combat, Kyle? I was, but I, I don't think we actually got to see the combat play out of the first one. Mm, that's right. I wonder, for a play of the game, I wonder, I love this, um... <laughs> <clears throat> This horn, I'm just imagining that 
you you engage in these like wrestling maneuvers. <laughs> so maybe there's one where you've like you've like speared some Mac and you flipped them over. So you just get this great like reverse suplex sort of thing. <laughs> very flashy. That's very Hercules Beetle for sure. And, and finally, Kayo, what was one of Ishikawa's play of the games? So since Ishikawa has those extreme range weapons and they have sensors, I'm going to say that it's like a really long view of a shot he took. And it's like I was engaging with this mech in melee, and then I, I dropped down and the shot just flies over my head, and the mech just explodes in front of me. It was like a, a trick shot that we set up. So I'm going to complicate this a little bit further. I want you to all kind of think about, you know, we're, we're sitting here in this conference room and we're, and we're kind of reminiscing about some of these, these shots, right? Ishikawa, when you look at your, your shot there, what about uh, that memory kind of triggers like this feeling of doubt? Uh, I think his targeting computer was on the fritz. And he had to dial it in, and it was it was kind of like fuzzy. He just kind of had to time it from, and it, it was he knew that there was a good chance of possibly missing or shooting a friend. And how about you have to taking on that hundred fifty ton battle hammer? What complicated it, right? Um... As someone who was who was there, yeah. like the, since this is like a big mining planet, maybe the ground that we were fighting on was unstable. So like right when I was about to blast it off, the ground let out beneath me. So I like maybe first I had to like drag it down with me, and then a panel popped it. So for a moment, you thought you might be getting sucked into the earth itself. Mm -hmm. well, that was thankfully cropped out of the shot. <laughs> Keeps me looking good. <laughs> Kayo, when you were in the middle of this like wrestling maneuver, what was making you filled with doubt? So speaking of cropping things out of the shot, I'm going to say that I know that there were people around that fight. It was too close to an urban area. And when I flipped it, it was like heat of the moment thing. And I almost dropped the, the thing right in, on top of a bunch of workers and I remember from that scene that there was a lot of people running from the combat while we were fighting. And it was just irresponsible and dangerous. Very cool. So we've got this hollow hockey air table, right? That it right now is doubling as a sort of hollow projector for your proposal here, Ishikawa. So this isn't necessarily you breaking down the mission, so to speak, of like, okay, first we're gonna hit this floor and then we're going to send in whoever this is you just talking about what you want to achieve with this engagement and why so as you know we're down Knox and Vinny uh, it'll just be the three mechs that are heading on uh, nice triangle as you guys know triangles very strong as strong as a sphere. And what I think we should, number one, do is make sure that this proxy war is too costly for further engagement. Secondary objective, if we can obtain the help of the rebels and give them enough confidence to continue the fight so that we aren't here involved in will be a very costly and protracted engagement. Uh, that secondary objective would benefit us and also benefit the planet. But would it benefit the rebels? I mean, we're better equipped than they are. We don't want to throw these people in the line of fire. I don't want to throw them in the line of fire, absolutely. What I want to do is help them to see the weak points, um, allow them to be support, allow them to be part of the victory 
And then that way we don't swoop in, cause a big mess, leave, and they're worse off than when they began. They might become paragraphs. We don't know what kind of sensor they have there. They, they can, we can leave the planet and then they will be hunted down by Apex and blamed for what we did. Nothing is going to fall on Walker's back and the rebels are going to be blamed for it. I understand we're taking a big chance, um, but doing nothing is unacceptable to me. So unless you have some alternatives, uh, I, I think we should proceed. I agree it is risky for them, but I think they're in graver danger if we do nothing. <laughs> Well, I'm not about to start doubting you now, but if things go south, I, I, I said my piece. I don't feel Understood. This. Understood. And if after this mission, again, like always, when we operate under contract, you're here because you want to be here. If you decide that this place is more important to you, I respect that. No harm, no foul. We can cut ties. And we remain brothers, but if you want to stay in this planet, I understand. I'm moving on. I want to do the right thing, but I've got work. And this is my job. Yeah, I'll stick around. I got my eyes on what, on what really matters. It, there's a moment where Ishikawa's like, I'm about to get into an argument, and he lets it go. I said stick around with the group, just to be, just to be clear. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I thought he was saying he was going to stick around the planet. I know what to do is right. I'm like, I thought it was just a little passive aggressive slam. I'm sorry. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, Ishikawa understands you way better than Rich over a hangout. Understood. The minute I said it, I realized this is not going to sound like the one that just sound. <laughs> cool. So half the. Kayo expressed the fear that this might end up um, with Administrator Walker getting off scot-free, right? How does that make you feel? I mean, in the... <laughs> I think at the end of the day, like, it doesn't really matter. And I think for aside from Knox... Uh, Hafta is definitely not going to talk about this little like side quest he's created for himself. So, but I think he's like filing that away, and he's like, I I'm trying to figure out what what moments I can steal before we do this, where I can like get my pieces in place. <laughs> so I probably am just looking very distracted in the meeting. Do you pick up on that at all, Ishiko? And if so, do you bother to say anything? Do I pick up on half the thinking sneaky thoughts? No. It's kind of like That's a, a constant. It's, it's a constant. It's just it's like breathing, right? the thing. Yeah, it's like the power lines, you know, where you don't, until you're out in the woods and you're far away, you don't hear the power lines. That's half to thinking sneaky thoughts. I'm just like, uh, it's half to. <laughs> half to be there when I need it. We well, shall that's see. True. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm thinking here again is that we can all look to this engagement role as a way to sort of think about how we can prepare for this mission and things we might want to do ahead of time. So basically how I'm going to handle it, some of these questions seem like they that your pilots might not know the answer to them, right? Um, like, is the broader situation, operational situation in the team's favor? Or uh, is the team engaging a strongly held enemy position? You might not know that, right? So here's how I'm going to rule that. Basically, uh, if the answer is I don't know, mechanically we're going to make that a yes. So if you are deciding we're going to punch through this place not knowing whether or not they have a... Uh, you know, uh, mortars set up or, or force fields or anything like that, that's just as bad as if they actually did, you know, because you're going in a little blind. So mechanically, you're going to face that, uh, that penalty, right? So when it comes time for you to be planning this, this mission, uh, Ishikawa, you're probably going to be thinking a little bit about these questions, right? And maybe by thinking of what 
the answers to these questions are or what you'd like them to be, maybe that'll help us kind of come up with a bit of a strategy. I think we can all work together to make a cool kind of mission here, right? I don't want to put it all on Rich's hands. So let's try to take a real collaborative approach to this. I'll help out too. Um, and we can kind of come up with a cool plan and, and a cool heist slash explosion extravaganza, right? Cool beans. So I've shared a picture of uh, this headquarters, right? Um, I guess I want to talk a little bit more. So we, we have this, what I've written down for our primary objective is tax apex out of the proxy war. So you want to do enough damage. You want to cost them enough money that they're going to say, this isn't worth it and give up you know, th this method, whether that means allowing for friendly competition as opposed to trying to gain a monopoly with, you know, hired farmers, so to speak. Um, but we want we want to make this expensive for them, right? Um, and then secondary objective is to try to inspire the rebels. So kind of the cool thing, I think, in this case about the all systems nominal rules is that basically um how the the combat roles work out at the end of the mission your position in that fight helps determine if you achieve those objectives or not so if you do really well in this combat scenario in this mission these two rounds if you get a good position that's going to mean that you achieve your secondary objective right you don't necessarily need to fictionally justify it it's going to happen if you do well but we could still tie that into the fiction of course um so when we look at the engagement role again this is basically the the start um of the mission not necessarily when we're waiting in and exchanging blows this is us seeing basically we know that the sort of position that you're starting into so we're not rolling that yet because we're preparing ourselves to get into that phase. But this is where we're going to start looking at those questions, which are on page 115, four. <laughs> cool. So the first question is going to be, is the team well supplied? So that begs the question for me, what supplies do you want to bring into this mission, Ishikawa? Well, our, our, our beautiful selves. Um, and I think that if you term it as supply, we'd like to have the rebels as support and, and backup. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess about all that we can reasonably expect to bring to this fight. And, unless somebody has an idea, because I'll take it. I have a baby idea, because I'm wondering if we can... Get, gain some fruits of that the mini hacking <laughs> session at the end of it that was directed at administrator walker but if our kind of what we want to do is like really fuck up the proxy war maybe there's something that like assets nearby or something like that maybe there's something about like layout or something or like regional awareness situational awareness that i could have that i could contribute Absolutely, because it doesn't sound like she's been very forthcoming with all of her information. Sure hasn't been. Maybe, maybe like when you hack her, you realize how the usual structure for one of these companies goes. So you can just log into the server and delete their spreadsheets that says how much money they're making or something like that, and just disrupt the organization. Hmm. Oh yeah, maybe yeah, maybe we can tie that in with like we'll do a big like data bomb. And together with all this like physical destruction, the beautiful bow at the end. <laughs> Bye. I, I like the visual of like the their like stock graph like crumbling as you're like blowing up their building. That's pretty fun. And I think that th those things you suggested also tie into the second question of does the team have reliable and relevant intelligence? So I think you know some of those ideas can definitely uh, contribute to that answer as well. Um, so I, I like the idea of looking for 
assets, you know, um, these are probably things that would be mutually beneficial or profitable to the companies, but hey, who cares, right? <laughs> We're blowing everything up here today, um, which can also maybe kind of give us some idea about um, the the terrain, so to speak, that we're seeing here. Uh, and an organization is, is an interesting idea as well. I think that that could possibly help you to pinpoint your target or something like that, where you think the linchpin of this operation could be. Uh, which also then again leads us to uh, the next question, the enemy being especially vulnerable to the team's approach. So how might we be able to create that uh, situation. Any ideas there? How can we make Apex vulnerable to this Lance? What is their weakness? I think in the same industry as Mariah, right? It's like a competition for the resources, right? Right. On this planet, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, maybe there's like standardized equipment. So like maybe what we did get from Mirai or from Administrator Walker was like <clears throat> how the machinery works. <laughs> so we we can like pinpoint with like very with a lot of accuracy how to cripple uh, Apex. Right. So there's an opportunity to sabotage some of their machinery because you have access to similar and you can study it and, and learn from that. Okay. My suggestion. I like it. Any other ideas there? Does that sound pretty juicy? Yeah, I I I was like what was bouncing around in my head was the idea of some kind of we have codes to get us in, but I I don't I don't know if I buy that. Feels too Star Warsy, <laughs> right? I, I I know where you're coming from. Uh, excellent. Okay, we need to find out whether or not you're engaging a strongly held enemy position. We need to find out what sort of opposition you might be facing, right? Um, and that that answer you might find to be yes anyway, <laughs> but it might it it might also be no if you look into it. Um, or maybe you can um, find a way to to make that not the case, right? Like you could cause a distraction or something like that to try to divert their forces or something like that. Um, so that might be something worth looking into. Then we have we're like we're attacking their corporate headquarters, right? On the on this planet, not the overall one. We're not attacking a factory, for example. Right. Well, it sounds like this this um, particular headquarters is also doubling as a, a, a mining operation. I think that's partly because of that's the way the Apex operates is very efficiently. They went ahead and built this this mining rig and drill at this spot. Well, we need a place for headquarters. Let's just put it on top. <laughs> you know, there's only so many plots of land, and they each cost money. So it's kind of like having a yogurt shop. First part of your building. <laughs> right. L living above the restaurant. <laughs> cool. Um, we're also going to be asking if your mecha have a significant speed advantage over the enemy. Having a knowledge of that might affect the sort of plans you would make. So one thing we discussed in the Hangout chat earlier this, this week or prior um, was how we're going to play with those rules a little bit. So right now we have specific maneuvers that are outlined that fit into certain positions so that if you have a more advantageous position, different maneuvers are available to you. But we had some pushback with those that maybe they felt a bit too restrictive or confusing. Um, and maybe you had a plan for a different way we can do this. So. I would say for this question, um, this one kind of stands out to me um, 
in the fact that it doesn't say like, well, do our mecha have a significant weight advantage? Um, why is that not part of the equation? I'm not sure. But I will say having fast mecha might give you a few more choices, I guess, tactically. Um, and knowing whether or not they have a bunch of heavy artillery that are kind of stuck in one place as opposed to having more flexible units, that's going to give you a better understanding of what you might want to do. Does that make sense? But I think that's going to kind of be folded into knowing what kind of opposition you're facing. Right. Okay. Um, and then we can figure out if this approach is going to be exceedingly complicated or not. That's a, a, a penalty to you. But if it's a penalty that helps you, if by creating an overly complicated battle plan, you're, <laughs> you're able to sort of overcome some of these other weaknesses you might have, you know, it might be might be a wash, right? Um, and then the broader operational situation, we can kind of discuss that just as a way to sort of get a final feel and tone for what's going on here. So I want to keep an eye on time. We're about an hour in, and we have about an hour and a half to pull this all off, right? I want to take a quick break. We'll be back at the top of the hour. Um, take some time while you're stretching your legs and and marinating all these questions to think about maybe some ideas you might like to propose. Um, we don't necessarily need to make anything overly complicated. I'm happy to montage some of these roles out to make some of these things just quick action roles to figure out the answers to these things. But let's take some time to... to do a little bit of a breather and let our minds percolate. See y'all at the top.
So I'm working on our mercenary laundry list here. <laughs> um, basically, I want to kind of pull the table and see what task everyone would like to accomplish as sort of a legwork phase, so to speak, how you would like to contribute to the mission before we actually perform it, right? So I'm looking at, we'd expressed a desire to uh, get in touch with the rebels as a way to see if we could maybe gain their assistance, if they could either supply us, whether that be with uh, arms and armaments or warm bodies or more mecha, things like that or however we might have them available as a resource. We've been talking about um, finding nearby assets, um, which could either be useful for a distraction as uh, a big F you to capitalism, if we were to blow it up, amongst other things. Um, we've talked about maybe looking at the organizational structure of this headquarters and this branch of the apex conglomerates uh corporate force um, and we've also talked a little bit about looking at maybe sabotaging machinery um and we've also looked at finding out what sort of defenses that they have. Those are some sort of items on the menu, but what is appealing to each of you the most? Maybe Ishikawa, I'll, I might start with you. If you have an idea, something that you think would be a priority that would be particularly helpful to have with you on this mission. I think Ishikawa's priority is uh, the secondary objective, right? There's not much more other than gathering intel and laying out a good plan for primary objective, which is us. our lance goes in, kicks ass, takes names, but recruiting the rebels, putting them in an effective and less than dangerous support role so that they can gain the knowledge and confidence they need to continue the fight is important to him. And, and I think he'd like to try to obtain that. Fantastic. How do you think he might go about doing that? I think he's got to uh, approach them on their turf and try to negotiate uh, for their aid and uh, sell them on the idea that they're going to be his support team. <laughs> Works for me. Who do you think is the best person for that job? I'll have to... Wait, did I say that out loud? Um... <laughs> I mean, Hafta does have some experience with rebellion. That's uh, just that true. Much. It's pretty rebellious. Well, can, are you sending me alone? No, I would never send you alone. <laughs> um, <laughs> idea. Who knows what rebellion you'd get? I'm wondering if Kyo. I don't know, Kyo. You seem pretty passionate about this, but then Ishikawa might just go on his own too. I don't know. This is tough. It's tough. I think I'm going to have to roll a die. You think about that, who you might want to delegate to that task. Uh, well, I ask Hafta what his priority is. What do you need to do ahead of time? Um, I think as I'm like snooping around and minding my own business, um, I maybe bring to Ishikawa this proposal uh, about some mining tunnels that we could use to get underneath Apex's base. Maybe we'll need to use explosives. I don't know. I'm not a miner. But <laughs> it's an option. <laughs> And this is part of the information that you're trying to gather from Walker's 
files and stuff, right? Yeah, I'm picturing it as like maybe it's just like old maps or something that like were supposed to be archived or deleted or something that I was able to like pull off of whatever computer things. Um, so it's like there should be these tunnels that are like unexploited that we could use to get right underneath them. Okay, very interesting. Uh, and how about Kayo? What is your priority? So I was looking at my sheet, and my specializations are diversion and infiltration. So I'm I'm pretty much super useful at this point. Yeah. But I want to be on the on the front lines for this. I want to make sure that the least amount of innocent people possible get hurt, and the most amount of corporate damage gets done. So I want to be Charging ahead in what somewhere, destroying an antenna while it could be bursting down through the wall. Fair enough. I love it. So, what is one way do you think that Kayo can help ensure that that happens? I think since my mech is pretty tough, I could charge in like five minutes before the official attack starts and just draw a lot of their fire to like, oh, this crazy guy with Omeka is, start, is attacking our building. Okay. I can use the tunnels to like, no, if I use the tunnels, they're gonna go for the tunnels after I'm done. I think I can go like with a pretty poor, like poorly planned assault on their, on the, on their end. They look, they, it just looks like I'm charging in without a plan, but I'm actually drawing fire so people can infiltrate from the mines without being detected. I like that plan. So what I would ask is if, if that is your plan to go in headlong, what sort of like uh, Intel or, or like, how, how are you, how would you prepare for that mission to try to make sure you survive it? <laughs> right. Um, does, does that include you uh, looking up, specs on the structures what what's going to be the best weak point for you to uh you know like uh gosh what does the kool-aid man say right uh oh yeah right what what's the best place for your oh yeah moment is this you looking for like patrols looking up their mechs and what you know ones are most vulnerable to melee like what would you how would you like to make that very effective. I think the two things that I do is I look up at the, the building structure and I just pick the point that's hardest to counterattack in. Like it has a lot of towers, it has a lot, a lot of overlapping structures, and I would just charge through there and kind of use the buildings in my favor. They don't want to shoot up their own company trying to get to me because it comes off their own paychecks. And uh, the other part would be that my, my mech has lighting plates that I use to cover its fists to, to feel good. So I think I could do that, just light plates over to the front and leave the back kind of exposed so I have a stronger front frontal defense as I'm doing this. Cool. So you're going to be looking for sort of a blind spot where they have to send people to deal with you directly. They can't just snipe at you from a tower. They have to focus on you. Yeah, I'm going to try to like get in the most inconvenient position possible. OK. So we have this laundry list here now, right? We, we're going to have somebody approach the rebels. We're going to have somebody uh, scope out these mining tunnels, right? And maybe plane explosives there, fingers crossed. Um, and then we're going to need somebody who's going to check out the structure somehow, either directly or through specs ahead of time, trying to talk to workers, however that might look. Uh, but those are our three tasks. So let's try to delegate here and see who thinks who would be best suited to that scene, or who would who who you'd like, which characters you'd like to see doing that. You know, whether they're good at it or not. <laughs> and Ishikawa, you are our commanding officer, so I think you might have final say here. But of course, we're all working together. So what are your thoughts? Um, let's let's list three again. So we've got. We've got the recruiting, got the intel gathering. What was the was the third? 
so we're gathering intel on uh, the tunnels and gathering intel on this blind spot for Kayo. Okay. Are each of you guys interested in the thing that you came up with? Or do we want to shuffle it by one step? Yeah, I'm interested in my own thing, but I also really liked the idea of Kaio and me going off to try and convince these rebels. <laughs> that gives us like two out of three, though, so I don't know. It's totally cool to, to pair up on these if we want to do it as a group. That's cool, too. Um. Well, yeah, once you get, I, I like the idea that you two pairing up. I especially think that one of our goals was more personal scenes, and you guys have a lot of stake in that. So let's lead off with that, and uh, and then we could just do everything in pairs. But then, then I don't know. Well, here's what we can do. Let's have you two pair off and approach these rebels, and maybe we can we can do a side by side scene here. Let's let's bunch this intel gathering into one task, right? Someone's, because you can, it's not interesting to both hack for information on the tunnels and information on the structure. Let's just say that's one big juicy thing. Um, but let me ask you this, Rich. Do you want another scene with Ishikawa and Administrator Walker, or have you had your fill? Because <laughs> she might be a good person to go to if you need this sort of intel. Yeah. I, I think it's a good idea. We, or you could approach strap for resource resource points. I, I'm good to. I, I, Rich liked role playing with Walker. That was fun, so I'm not opposed to it at all. That sounds good. I will propose an alternative. Okay. If you want to go to the local bar, and find some disgruntled Apex workers, and see if they want to maybe give you some ideas. That could be fun too. Let's do that as a fallback. I think going to talk to Walker sounds more fun to me for Ishikawa. So, yeah. Okay. So, Kyle, I'm totally cool with you being audio only, Louise. Um, so, let me ask you real quick as a scrapper, as someone who uh, is familiar with rebelling against these corporate structures and, you know, having these sort of conversations that you don't like to have in public, you'd probably have an idea about where these rebel folks might like to meet. So where do you think that would be? Mm -hmm. Like uh, a place I could contact them. I think they could hang around a, a kind of black market in the city where people can exchange goods outside of the corporation's price tables. So it's cheaper to get stuff, and sometimes stuff that the corporation doesn't want getting in on the planet. So I think I go like in this shady den that I, that I know I can find some people who are connected to the rebellion. Cool, cool. Let's paint this scene a little bit, right? So um, we've already established that this planet's kind of dusty. You know, I'm imagining we're, we're seeing a lot of like flapping tents and uh, like rusted metal structures and sort of like wind worn, you know, large towers and things like that. Um, and this is a mining town. So we're probably hearing a lot of people, we're seeing a lot of people with like respirators or we're hearing a lot of people with old bad coughs, right? Um, off in the distance, there's this sort of heartbeat of the machines, you can even kind of feel it in your toes still a little bit of it kind of never leaves you, right? Um, but like we said, these people are used to that. So when you find this sort of shady alley, right? This sort of black market, I'm thinking there's gonna be one thing that is like um, very, obviously apparently dangerous and <laughs> probably should be regulated you know like what what is this this sort of uh there's a there's something out here for sale that's putting you on edge just being near it what are they what are they trading with here i would say it's just a very 
poorly synthesized form of future drug that's been banned in most countries, most planets. Corporations hate it because it screws productivity by making people really addicted and impossible to function in society. Right. Well, they're all for the addictive drugs that like improve productivity, but not so much the other way around, right? Yeah. So what do you, you what do you see? They don't give you real. <laughs> well, what do you what do you see half of that is like a ticking time bomb, so to speak? Uh, what was that? Um. I think oh, it's a ticking time bomb to have to. Um, I think that. I kind of know about you all, but if I went to like a county fair flea market and then there was a table full of handguns, <laughs> like I'd be a little on edge, right? So what's that equivalent here for you mm -hmm. in this <laughs> new space future? <laughs> That just sounds like a state fair in rural America. <laughs> yeah, that's um, like an Ohio thing, but yeah. I hope not. I stay away from the fair. Um, probably for that reason. Um, yeah. Um, let me think in this future. You know, I think it, there are, it's like a pyramid scheme, and you can find these people everywhere who are, these like poor suckers who got drawn into this. Mm -hmm. And um, what it is, is it's like you do like a genetic signature, like you sign with like your thumb and it pricks you and it gets their blood. And that's how they like get you into the pyramid scheme, scheme by like legally obligating you into it. And it's something, I don't know, maybe it's something like off world mining or something. It's like really, really dumb and like not great. So I mean, like, spend a year in, like, a far distant area, and it's, like, a terrible shithole of a planet where you do something menial. And then it's, like, just for a year. And then you come back, get three more people to sign up, we give you a huge bonus. I wonder if that resonates with you all as a, at all as a mercenary, as you see that. So, Rich, what is, like, sort of alongside these two dangerous proposals here that's actually something um that everyone should have access to that indicates you know they don't really have this in in full supply and that's why it's on the black market right like what are they selling at this black market rich that should be on every grocery store shelf oh pure water very cool 100% pure. <laughs> All right. So that's sort of the the market stall that you're walking up to. Um, who's who's, who's uh, stepping up? Who's going to break the ice here? I'd say I do it because I have the, the connected talent. Okay. So you probably already know this person then in some way. Hmm. Is that what that talent them. means, right? I don't know. It just means I get more resources. It doesn't really specify. In my head, it just plays as knowing how to, like, because I'm basically from the same social status that they are. So I kind of know the how to approach them. Yeah. So I'm thinking the person we have here, um, I'm imagining that, it, that they're cast by Octavia Butler. It's because I just saw her in a film today. <laughs> um, wait, not Octavia Butler. Is it Viola Davis? Did you watch Weirdos? No, I watched uh, Instant Family. Octavia Spencer, sorry. Yeah, I'll take a look at Butler's uh, altar, right? Yeah. Like the I, Butler. Yeah. yeah, I think I've got my, my wires crossed there. <laughs> Octavia Spencer is is uh, the the person we're casting here for this mission, right? And she has on this this sort of like digital camo shawl, right? And like this sort of like tasseled scarf around, and it's like you could tell it's the point where it's pretty easy to sort of pop up on to cover her mouth or her nose if she needed to. Um, what is like what is this spark? between you two 
you know, what is the sort of mutual understanding that you both come from this kind of background? How do you how do you spot one another that way? So ah, I have an idea. Like in Latin America, in a lot of countries, it's common that when you get your shots as a kid, you you're left with a permanent mark on your arm. So pretty much everyone you see will have the same mark on their arm because of that one shot that leaves you scarred for life. So I think I have something like that. Like people who can't afford expensive healthcare get like less than ideal shots and so they're left with this tiny scar on their bicep and i think i just like scratch my arm and i show her that i have that and i see she has the same mark as well okay so you know that that alone has kind of piqued her interest you know she's not very familiar with you um and half over here has probably gotten a million shots up and down his body from weird high-tech syringes so it might not have the same mark um but yeah, how are you? How have you prepared yourself for this interaction here, Hafta? How have you have you altered your appearance in any way? Oh, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah, I like this idea of like shawls and scarves and dusters. So maybe I'm maybe well, I'm definitely out of like our little outfit uniform. And I definitely don't want to look like somebody who's been interacting with Mirai. Um, I think it's like a poncho. I think I've got like a poncho on that I maybe picked up earlier, like from some other market, like a normal clothing shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like a poncho and then maybe some like dust goggles. If we want to go there with this planet, it's like very barren and dusty because of like all the work is just kicking up dirt everywhere. Um, yeah, I like that. <laughs> Poncho and goggles. <laughs> Very cool. So this woman, she kind of eyes you up and down, Kayo, and she says, uh, if you're here for the uh, for the scenic coal mines, sorry to tell you, you've been suckered. Yeah, no, I, I did a run once. It wasn't my thing. Yeah, well... You made it out alive. Good on you. So what brings you to Eratan for this beautiful scenic landmark? Well, you know how it is. You you go to the planet, you try to meet some cool people, make friends, hmm. socialize. You know, I wouldn't necessarily call this orb of shit any kind of social greeting hotspot. Well, I found that you can always meet interesting people if you know where to look. So what about you? Are you a diamond in the rough? <laughs> She's addressing this to you, after. <laughs> <laughs> look, do you want to start a rebellion or not? And cut. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go. That's a perfect place to dramatically cut to uh, Lieutenant Ishikawa. Uh, I love our entering into Administrator Walker scenes and and seeing what she's up to. Um, so yeah, what what uh, iconic uh, short brief activity are we seeing from Administrator Walker as you walk in? What is she in the middle of doing? We've had her gazing listlessly uh, through her window onto a factory assembly line sort of place with a drone, uh, things of that nature. What you I, I think I think she's basically filing reports, like expense reports, and looking over the bottom dollar, right? Because that kind of ties into what we're trying to do to Apex. So yeah, I think I think kind of for the first time. So she's always exuded this air of confidence, right, and sort of uh, like dogged determination. But I think we see her for a rare moment, maybe looking a little bit optimistic. And she's out here crunching some numbers. You know, she has to use a calculator, unfortunately, um, unlike our friend Hafta. But she's got these sort of kind of like futuristic 
slick like bifocals on right and she's got like a couple different holographic keyboards up that she's sort of you know multitasking between you know a few but you walk in Ishikawa and she says oh you know kind of takes off her glasses if it's not the lieutenant mission accomplished that was quicker than I thought not quite We've had some changes in the organization of the Lance, and we are going at uh, the complement of three, and therefore I need some more information. And I thought you would be a good resource since this does ultimately benefit you. Hmm. Well, if I've learned anything on here, it's how to make do with, with what little you have. So... What were you hoping to find out? Some intel will be helpful. Um, we understand that there are some tunnels, of course, as a byproduct of the hard work that your corporation has been doing to mine this place. Are there any uh, maps of said tunnels that could give us some kind of access to Apex? <sighs> So you're going after the headquarters then, directly, with a company of three. It's very bold. Well, my associates are recruiting the rebels per our secondary objective that you and I discussed. So as you suggested, it was a good idea. Well, certainly if you can supplement that as well with some more volunteers... <laughs> as long as you're doing damage to Apex, it's no sweat off my back. But those tunnels, like you say, were rather expensive. I'd hope that you'd be treating them with care. And I th that's just kind of giving you like a little bit of a suspicious knowing look there. So what I think here, she has this intel, right? Of course she does. But you kind of have to convince her that it's going to be worth the risk for her to give it to you. Mm -hmm. So that could look like an action roll here, I think, right? Yeah, that's, that's cool. I'm not sure what other details to lay out. She already knows the benefit that we've proposed. And I tried to lay out that I'm at a higher risk of failure. So leg up from Intel might help even the scale. Excuse me, even the scale. Uh, so what kind of role are we looking at? That's a good question. Um, so I'm looking at Ishikawa's uh, character sheet here. And I would just say, you know, in terms of like advantage dice, right? Mm -hmm. Your specializations don't necessarily apply to this specific situation, but I do think that you've had some success with Walker in the past. You sort of have managed to win her over, so to speak. She's already agreed to let you want to do this. Um, so you're going to have like one advantage die from your previous encounters with her. But that's only two dice, and you're hoping for a six, right? So I think if you want to get another leg up, you're going to need to give her some concrete assurance now, or you're going to have to lie. Come up with a lie to further reinforce your, your uh, persuasion here. So if you can think of a way to either provide concrete assurance now or ah, I got a it. good lie. So I, you know, I imagine we have like these little scroll phones kind of thing and he gets a little bleep. Well, I'm happy to report that the rebels are on board and that will help to ensure our success, not only our success, but the plan is that we will be using them as 
secondary support to help increase their capabilities. So all we need now is an insertion point. And then the lie is that they're 100% on board when I have no, no, do not have that information at all. Right. So we're going to cut back to the message that's being sent to you. <laughs> but it sounds like we have three dice on the table. So why don't you go ahead and roll that? And when we come back to you, we'll look at those results. So um, what is this message that's been sent to Ishikawa actually say? Who do we think sent the message here? Oh, it might not. It might not even be a message. Like it, it could easily be a like he just kind of whisper syncs his phone and tells it to ring. But if you guys want to send a message, that'd be hilarious. Thumbs up emoji, gun emoji, blast emoji. <laughs> is is that basically it? Are we are we are we sending a a, a uh, optimistic? we're good message or is it a uh, dramatically ironic this isn't looking good message well do they want to start a rebellion or not it's <laughs> a very good question although also maybe we would just let ishikawa think it's good regardless <laughs> so we, we cut back you know to this sort of tense moment and this kind of taken aback look. You want to start a rebellion? Well, we haven't even been formally introduced. It's probably better that way. Well, looks like I'm dealing with the professionals. Hey. Well. Look, it's it's easy to see, look around you, the kind of conditions that we're forced to suffer under. It's easy to tell the dog that I have in this fight. It's my only livelihood. I don't need to know your name. You don't need to know my name. But what I want to know is, and she points to you, Kayo, right? Because I think that she thinks that you're the, you're the, the true leader in this moment. What's your dog in this fight? You said that you see how poor your conditions are. I'm from a place where we don't have to worry about that. And me and my friends, we work so that we can make little changes to places like these. So you can have mildly better life. And the starting point for that is attacking the companies that make this happen. You have to get organized. You have to go after the big guys. And that's the only way you're going to do this is with us because they're trying to pitch us against, like they're trying to use us as soldiers on their war. And that's the opportunity you can use to turn things around in your favor. She kind of side eyes over to that display of the, the the pyramid scheme right and it's sort of like this like sunny beach right and and there's some like attractive guy out there saying like come on down to to ribus six or whatever she looks at that for a moment she turns back to to the two of you you know what they say about something that sounds too good to be true you're telling me that you're a couple of freedom fighters about this whole galaxy full of shitholes, decides that Eritan 4 is your pet project. You're coming here to liberate me and my friends. Is that right? I can speak for everyone. I don't. It's like this ideal world where people just fight for a cause doesn't happen. But I do. And at least for now, my friends are fighting for the cause as well. Because for once, we're going to get paid to beat down a company. You can use that to build something better for yourself, or you can just use it to get back at people who make your life miserable. You can doubt our intentions all you want, but the end result is the same. Tonight, we're going to hit one of the big guys, and you can be there, or you can just sit out and let people make choices for you, as you usually do. 
Ooh, fire. Okay. That's very compelling. Uh, this is a good time to take this to a roll, right? Um, but we can do a group action here too. I, I That's one thing that I think is really interesting about this setting is that group actions require um, a little question to be asked before we do that. Um, so are you helping out here as well, uh, Hafta, do you think with this? Yeah, absolutely. I, <clears throat> I'll let Kyle spout the idealism, but at the end of the day, we are taking down a big corporation. And at the end of the day, I'm fully on board passing off Administrator's Walker, Administrator Walker's info to them. So, you know, Machiavelli. <laughs> cool. Um, so looking at this helpful role here, you're going to take plus one D. Um, but you're going to, um, I want you to roll that die, Darren, and then the other ones are going to have, Louise, we're going to roll for you. So looking at your character sheet, um, I'm going to give you a plus one advantage die for having a similar background to this person, being able to empathize with them. Um, but as far as Kayo, we have this connected talent as well. So even though this, we're going to make this an action role as opposed to a resource role, just because I can't be bothered to look up that mechanic right now. Um, I'm going to give you that plus one D there. So you're sitting at three and then plus one more from Darren. Right? So you roll your three, and Darren, you're going to roll yours. But while you're working that out, uh, what did you get, Rich, with your rolls? It was not a critical is two sixes, if I remember correctly. I think you're so right. So it was not that. I got a six and a four. Okay. But so you did have a complete success, I believe. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get all the information you need. Um, I think with, with this, with, with a six, you're going to get full Intel on one of these things. So you're either going to get full Intel on the mining tunnels or full Intel on this blind spot. So which do you want? And then we'll work that out in the fiction. I think the blind spot sounds like the, the best, right? It's going to get us in a good tactical kickoff position. And with our speed, we do a lot of damage. So I think that's where I want to go. Sounds good. So we'll have this rumor of these tunnels, but it might take some action rules to try to find your way to your exit plan or plan B or what have you. How's that sound? Okay. So Minister Walker says to you, Ishikawa, I have a vision. I have a grand plan for Era 10 4. It doesn't look like much now. But I think with the right people installed in this planet, that this can really be a turnaround for Mirai. I was looking at this place all the wrong way. It's just a stopping point, a little hurdle on the way to my great career. And I couldn't wait to get off of it, to get away from these obligations here, to go off to, to Riba 6, you know, and, and uh, start designing cases for people's uh, cellular devices, right? Things like that. But, you know, your help here... Your pep talks, so to speak, <laughs> they've invigorated me. And I think that Eratan 4 can become a place of great value to the symposium. I will show them exactly what I'm capable of. And I'll find myself in a position where I can go anywhere in this galaxy that I want to. And unfortunately, those mining tunnels... That interconnected network is part of my grand plan, and they're just too, too much to, to risk. But 
I've been doing a little bit of digging myself. Real estate research, so to speak. Future sites for Marai Deeks, future plots. And this headquarters, you know, it's it's got some some blind spots, so to speak. Places that I was thinking about beefing up for security later on. I made a mental note. And she uh, you know, shoots you this holographic <laughs> message here, right? Um, and it's sort of like a, a file that's that's highlighting some of the weak points of this headquarters. You're gonna be able to use that information to tell you a little bit about the opposition, what's waiting for you, um, and a really great place to have Kayo kind of spearhead this mission. So that's gonna be helpful for your engagement. Uh, how does that make you feel? Is it me or Rich? I guess I'm asking Rich. You know, this this grandiose message that Administrator Walker has just shared with you. It's, it's interesting. Um, better than no. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> How do you... When you hear her sort of propping herself up and having this this great plan, do you think that it's going to work out for her? Do you care? <laughs> I, you know, do I think it's going to work out for her? Maybe. Ambitious people do have to have some kind of drive. She definitely has that. This planet, though, seems like a place that you don't necessarily put your best and brightest who are next to move up the ladder. Um, and her penchant for hiding information that's important for success has worked against all of us so far. So, yeah, I think ultimately she's not going to do well. So, what were the results of our role, gentlemen? Darren, let's start with you. What number did you roll on your die? Got a five. Okay. So I'm looking at this table here with these questions for contributors. In this moment, do you trust in Kayo's determination? No. <laughs> Sorry, Kayo. <laughs> Why not? Oh, because I think this is taking too long, and I think that uh, these people like don't really have it in them, and I think that Kayo's idealism is like a waste of time. Um, like that's not the way you're gonna get people to like act out against someone else <laughs> or an organization or anything. Um, so yeah, very well. Uh, how did you roll, Kayo? My highest one was a four. Okay. Well, I have to, like, I'm sorry, I rolled at that time. It's that you roll four die, but should I roll again and take one out? Is that it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to confuse you with the math there. Yeah, I'm having you roll three, and we're going to lump together the success from half to. Okay. Just to see, maybe you can get a six out of there. I got a five. Okie dokie. Uh, yeah, so that's still a mixed success, right? Um, yeah, so that entails you do what you're trying to do, but there are consequences, trouble, harm, reduced effect, etc. So... Let's talk real quick about what you want to task these rebels with because they're gonna they're gonna be all in. They're ready to do this job. I think and in fact, let's let's do this let's just do this with a dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. So she says to you, all right, 
I'm in. And when I'm in, we're in. Let's make that clear. You seem to have a good head on your shoulders. What are you? What would you have us do? So I think at this point, I look at Hefta and I say, because like I remember on what Ishikawa was saying and how I said that I didn't want to put them in risk. And I just have that split second where I think, oh, maybe I could actually just tell them to give us resources and then stay out of it so nobody would get hurt. But I'm going to be a team player. I think Hefta might rather rep me out if I, if I do something shady. Since Darren doesn't trust my determination. Um, <laughs> I'm it's half say, it's not there. It's only half yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Um I'm gonna say, well, we need people and we need explosives. We're taking them down from below. I'm I'm basically telling them that we're gonna send them through the tunnels if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. Darren doesn't look happy with <laughs> No, I love it, but we didn't get the tunnel, so I think that that's oh yeah the worst. And I love it. I love it that because we don't know. Yeah, like, we, we don't know. And I think that would be a good idea if we had the tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in. I love it. I think we should roll ahead with it. Yeah. Um, we've got the men. We've got the explosives. Let's let's uh, let's shake it up. So, I think we are ready to jump into the mission. Um, maybe we add a few more descriptive details to kind of get us all on board. But I think we can kind of short circuit towards that a little bit, right? Is there anything else, though, that anybody wanted to accomplish before the mission? Go ahead and raise your hand if there was any other scenes you wanted to have. Okay, so let's look a little bit um, at this map, right? I'll kind of describe a little, a few of the things we have going on here. So we can see off in the distance, right, in the in the background, we see this sort of um, like long line, right? This, this look almost like a road. I'm thinking that's like what these tunnels look right, like, right? Um, and I'm I'm imagining from this sort of triangular base that this uh, installation has, that there's like basically three tunnels that are leading underground into this place. So they're connected off to different uh, different plots, different veins, you know, different drills that they have out there. But this is the sort of central location. So you could go to one of these veins that are probably a little bit less um, guarded and they can come to the this sort of central location. The rebels can come there. They can easily disguise themselves as workers from one of these offshore locations, so to speak, and meet you there and line up explosives. But <laughs> let's just say I'm going to put that mixed success off to the off uh, for a little bit. You know, that's what the result of that might be. Um, then we have. As far as like the direct approach goes, what a blind spot might look like, um, they have a couple of these towers posted at these three entry points for these triangles, right? Um, and I think that those could be very good locations for them to have snipers, artillery, missiles, mortars, right? But I kind of look at this one in the background, the third one, and I'm not seeing those same structures for whatever reason. So one of these entrances, we'll call it, um, we'll call it, you know, entrance gate alpha, right, is under protected. That's the sort of, in you know, when we're looking at this this sort of like three dimensional cool hologram that Administrator Walker's provided with you, she's got the little like notes at this one point, you know, sort of like this like beam of light comes out and says, you know, needs more uh, artillery support, right? That place is vulnerable to 
Kayo's direct approach. Cool. Um, what else do we want to know? So with that information, right, as far as what this looks like, and again, we have this terrain, the outside of this triangle is there's a lot of rocks, there's a lot of cover. I'm imagining that's kind of what an extreme range might look like. We're not doing the battle map in the same way. Um, the tags are basically going to be relative, right? So think about like if this was lots of other PDTA combat games where it's like uh, if you have a far tag on your weapon, that means if you're far from your opponent, you're better. <laughs> it's easier to it's easier to shoot someone with a rifle far away than it is if you're up close. But if you had an SMG, you know it's a little bit easier up close because you can turn around those corners, so to speak, right? So when I say this is the extreme range, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only place where your uh, Goss rifle is going to work, right? <laughs> But that's what, if we're imagining this as a circle, that's one, one thing we might see. So in the extreme range, we kind of have these rocky hills, and uh, it's not very well paved. But then we have um, this, this uh, next inner ring of the compound, right? Um, and this is sort of well paved. I'm imagining this is like our, our lower level, right? Um, there's probably lots of... Uh, wheeled vehicles or like low hovering vehicles that are transporting uh, materials and ores and things like that. There's probably a little bit more ground activity going on here. And this is that sort of first inner layer of this compound. And I think that that's also where you have direct access to this giant <laughs> molten drill that's sort of uh, beneath the, the complex itself. And then if you wanted to, you could go up higher um, following this, I think, again, with this triangular structure, we sort of have these three ramps that go up into the structure itself um, that lets you go into the offices, the headquarters, things like that. Um, and then you have straight up cubicles if you really want to <laughs> get in there and mess things up. But there might be some collateral damage if you do. So... That's sort of the, the bird's eye view. Anyone need have any more, you know, sort of concrete visual details you want of this place? Is there anything, are there any of these areas that are foggy to you that you want us to get higher resolution on? Um, I wasn't going to do, I think I get the image, but I just wanted to add a detail because I liked this, that idea of dust storms and stuff. So yeah. I just wanted to, concretize that and like make that a thing in our minds this billowing blowing dust that's like you know sometimes strong ones sometimes not that's okay. very cool <laughs> i'm imagining there's one of those going on right now right um so i'm thinking that's affecting visibility it's making things good for you and maybe bad for you it's something you're going to have to deal with uh which you might figure into your plans um yeah i always forget about weather every every single freaking rpg book i read has a table about weather and i always forget to actually use it so thank you darren um yeah well let me ask you louise give, give us another like cool visual detail um as we're sort of getting this this uh drone shot of before we go on the mission uh what's something that sticks out to you something that's not in our picture I think it's a very cloudy night with a, a bright moon. How many moons does this planet have? Oh, I love that question. Two moons, at least. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would say that it has... Uh, I'm, I'm going to be extra. I'm going to say that it has three moons, and each of them is a primary color. So they're, they're red, yellow, and blue. And uh, the clouds keep passing over the moons and, like, tinting the landscape different colors. And we see, like... Uh, the mecha's moving in the shadows like kind of like anime opening e like it's mm -hmm. dark and then there's a, a red a red overlay and then we see my mecha moving behind a rock and then there's a blue overlay and we see like people jumping in, going into the tunnel and stuff like that freaking sweet 
I should I should let you all do this more often. Uh, Rich, it, when you look at this image, it's a lot to take in, right? And if you're anything like me, sometimes when you are given a bunch of visual detail, there are certain elements of it that kind of just get hazy and fuzzy, right? So pick if you are having any of those fuzzy spots, pick one out and, and help us to get a bit more resolution on it. I don't know if this is what you're leaning for, but I'm as I was listening to everything that's going on, the fact that we've got so much uh, smelting, drilling, and everything going on, uh, I do see a picture of a ship that's arriving, so I'm curious mm -hmm. about the docking timings and if that is something we can align within our night attack because i would imagine that hmm well are they are they heavily defended or are they just kind of automated freighters that could be something that could be used to our advantage make it look like we're well actually it'd be even better if we just destroy it because you blow the hell out of that that's going to cost them tons of money anyway okay so just mumble through a whole lot of stuff uh the, yeah the, the clear point is what's our with the delivery or the the arrival pattern of their tramp freighters that are probably clearing out all the things they've smelted. I'll say something about the the cadence of your voice in that moment. I was drawn in cinematically. Like that was like the narration of this cool like tramp freighter like coming in in this dust storm, these big yellow lights like kind of you know, filtering all this dust through them as they're kind of landing and hearing the bustle of activity of all the, all the like grounds workers, like trying to get things lined up and, you know, getting all of these, uh, you know, lifters ready to, to move. Uh, I think that's a great intro to like this mission, right? With this, this, uh, this bustle of activity. Um, and also, Shout out to Louise for also remembering to think about what time of the day it is. Another very simple <laughs> visual cue that I as a GM always forget to include. So with this in mind, let's go ahead and do our very fun engagement role. So this is basically just telling us um, what sort of a position you're walking into, how how good of a, of a foothold you have. Um, and luckily we've done some work ahead of time to help us with this role. So let's count together. You get one for free. Um, looking at these questions, we want to know, is the team well supplied? You got rebels and bombs. That's a plus one for sure. Uh, does the team have reliable and relevant intelligence? Absolutely. We know exactly where this blind spot is. Um, it's. Are we thinking... It's probably where this uh, docking station is happening. You can't have all these towers lined up with, you know, snipers running around. If you need a place to, you know, sort of drop your 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 helicopter landing, so to speak, it's got to be clear. So that's our vulnerable position. Um, yes, is the team enemy especially vulnerable to the team's approach? Well, we've got the intel to sort of make that the case. So that's what we're going for. Does the team, uh, are they engaging a strongly held enemy position? So we've picked out a place, but we haven't necessarily looked into what kind of mecha they have or what the actual soldiers they're going to be facing you are. We're imagining that they're, they're rebels or farmers or, or people that have been sort of conscripted, right? But do they have a black guard? Do they have like a a uh, a special ops team that just guards the headquarters? We're not sure. So let's take one away from that for now. So we're back to three. Um, do we have a significant speed advantage over the enemy? Uh, again, I think we're not super sure, right? We've we've uh, picked a good place, but. We're at one limited timetable here, right? The the cargo freighter is coming to pick you up here soon. So we'll go, go back down to two. Does the approach involve an exceedingly complex battle plan? Honestly, this kind of just sounds like a straight-up pincer maneuver to me. This doesn't sound like some sort of, you know, 
nine dimensional space chess or whatever. Would you agree, Ishikawa? Pretty pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I try to keep things simple. Cool. So let's talk about this broader operational situation, right? Um, I think that this is going to be in y'all's favor, right? The sort of uh, the the linchpin, the 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 uh, element that's like really sort of uncertain here in terms of if things are going to swing for Apex or for Mirai. Right. What's really what's really going on here that's going to uh, have one of these corporations win over the other? And I think it's the workforce. Right? I think it's the rebels. Who's going to get on board with who? Um, and you have leveraged them. So I think by doing that, you've kind of put yourself in a better operational situation, broadly speaking, which I think brings us to four, if I've been counting correctly. And... We're going to go ahead and go with that because we have ourselves uh, a nice short period of time to try to wrap this cool combat up. So, uh, Ishikawa, roll four dice for us, and let's see what your starting position is. Man, I, I kind of want to designate. I want, I want to designate this to Hafta because Hafta is going to be the next in control. He's second in command. Teach him how to do it so he takes care of the engagement roll. Go for it. It's all, all on you. Right. Yeah, gladly. More dice. I need a one more dice, please. You're trying to teach these rebels to be soldiers. You're trying to teach Hafta to be a leader. <laughs> Everything's See, a teacher. Yeah, it works out for you. Uh, I got a two, a four, a two, and a five. A oh, five. Okay. So, where did I? Where does? Where is it? Where do we go? It tells you how to roll, but you have to go to a different section to find out what the results mean. Okay. So you had a five, is that correct? You said, Darren, right? Yeah. So that means we have a mixed success, which means we have a starting position of five. And remember, it's on the scale from zero to 10. We're trying to get to 10. So you're kind of right in the middle. Thing you have a little bit of an advantage here. Um, so let's talk about what we want the first exchange of fire to look like. Right? If I remember correctly, we want Kayo to go in first and to sort of be punching, right? Um, so who is backing him up? What position are you getting into to do that? Um, or is he going in alone? I think I'd probably back him up. Okay. There's only so many of us. <laughs> That's true. Oh, yeah. you're. I was about to address it to Ishikawa, but hey, you're you're running the show well, here. Half you, you got the engagement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah, I mean, I think I'm backing up Kayo. Probably not going to run right into melee with him, but... <laughs> right. So we're, we're kind of making up a maneuver here, right, where we're testing speed versus weight, basically. Um, and if it's the two of you, we're going to be testing your speed against... Well, it kind of depends on this maneuver, right? So... This sounds like a f direct frontal assault. This isn't like a hit and run thing. You're going in there with with your weapons, and you're going to be a force to bear. Is that right, Kyle? So, how about uh, how about you, Hafta? Where how are you contributing? Are you also going in guns blazing, or are you being a distraction? Is your speed coming into play here? Yeah, I like that. I, yeah. Um, I think maybe the the gag here is that I'm probably like drawing off forces and maybe isolating them in this like dust storm uh, and setting them up for a Kayo to take them out. Really. Oh, okay. So you're kind of so Kayo is still being stealthy here in this moment. 
he's taking out unsuspecting people that have been drawn in. I guess. Or is he going straight for this docking station and getting ready to blow up a very expensive, uh, to, to punch a, a helicarrier out of the sky? You know, like, what, what is this looking like? Yeah, my plan was to punch away while people, while people get organized underground. Okay. So you're, like, kind of picking off any distractions that would be interfering with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Anything, okay. like, not <laughs> in Kaya's direct line that he can deal with, I'll, I'll try and, like, get around and, like, pew, 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 pew. Right. So... While they're doing that, what are you off doing, Ishikawa? Are you trying to lead the rebels in your hypercycle or your mega cycle? That could be fun. Yeah, the mega cycle, leading the rebels in and using my speed to kind of get into the inner ring, kind of break them in, get them into the offices where they're smaller. Numbers are harder to squash kind of guerrilla tactics. I think that's Very story. cool. So I'm imagining when it comes to speed and weight and all that business, um, I have to remember exactly how this works. We're trying to compare them. So are the combined speed and weight of Hafta and Kaya, respectively. Um, wow. Let's just make this an action roll. <laughs> uh, Sounds good. Screw the maneuvers. Action roll. <laughs> OK. Action roll, but will affect your position as part of the consequence here. Um, let's start with, um, a group action role here from Kayo and Hafta again. So Hafta, get ready to roll your singular die for help. And then let's tally this up for Kayo. Um, we're starting with one, um, you got that brawler talent, you got that diversion specialization. You got that infiltration specialization. Um, you're starting with four. Uh, are you seeing yourself using any of your special systems in this as well? I could use the the jump jets to move around more quickly and do a lot of spread out damage and avoid harm. Well, let's give you five. I think that you are in. You're putting yourself in an ideal position. Let's give you six with your weapon. Uh, are you spending edge? Well, why not? OK. Let's go ahead and roll seven die. And then you're rolling one more. Uh, have to add to that. But I'm going to ask your question when you do. Um, oh, great. We get to ask that same question. Rich, uh, you are definitely being a high speed driver here. Mm -hmm. um, so we got two there. What else do you think is contributing to this action of this this infiltration here? Are you using any augmentations um, or any of your special systems? I'm actually looking up augmentation. I don't remember what I was thinking when I wrote that down, and it's not a standard thing. I don't see it listed. I think it was maybe having to do with like cybernetic implants or something like that, which maybe yeah. could increase that, your reflexes or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that sounds familiar. Um, so with that in mind, then absolutely, I think it is an important part of this. Um, I'm not using ranged combat, so my shootist is out. Um, sensor locks on enemy units. I think that could work or you think that's pushing it too much sensor lock getting me a plus one d in the next engagement stage well, yeah if you're mm -hmm. you, you could fold this into your narration as part of what you're doing is as you're going underneath uh going into the core you're kind of gathering locks on potential uh targets right because you you 
the next stage is going to be you breaking into the cubicle. Right. Cool. So this might be you getting ready for that. So I'm doing sensor logs using my hacking module, basically trying to yeah, screw up their systems, get locks on them for future stuff, and using the rebels effectively is kind of a smoke screen for me to set all this up for when we hit. Yeah, um, I'm going to give you a, an advantage die for having the rebels here with you also. All right, so, cool. Well, so, stick you have five. You leveled up. You're an ace now, so you have three edge. Is there any you'd like to spend on this action? I will spend an – I'm rolling five right now. Is that what you yep. said? I'll, I'll spin one edge. I think it's really important to hit this very, very well. Cool. So you're at six. Um, so while you all are rolling, I'll, let's kind of describe this activity a little bit visually, right? So we've already talked about how we're walking through um, this dust cloud, right? Um, what does it look like? For you, Kayo, as you are heading towards this this freighter, you know it's got these big yellow lights. I'm imagining there's some smaller structures, some vehicles you could be hiding behind. But are you doing any of that, or are you just thundering? I think initially I'm gonna be stealthy as I get in, and right. I'll start to be stealthy with a I have no filtration. So we see a lot of shots of uh, this Mac jumping behind shadows at the last minute, and people in guard not, not realizing it's there. And then we have like two mooks having a conversation at the hangar, and then it's this big beetle shaped Mac just jump jets into the hangar and starts. Beautiful. I think I just stop like a helicopter in the air. Like I hold, I hold it still, and then I pull out the. Uh, whatever you call the, 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 I pull out the blades and then I set it down and I just start wrecking stuff up. But then I like a conscious way. I let people run away first. I'm like, oh, I'm going to crush you. And then I wait a couple seconds. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not taking out any jumpsuits just yet. Uh, so what sort of cool like anime athletic thing is Melior doing here, right? Like what are we seeing from, from that mecha? Um, <clears throat> I think outside when I'm dealing with the the stragglers, keeping them off of um, um, off of them off of Kyo, um, this dust storm I think is like bullying Melier's form, and but every time um, there's like the little hand blast, it's like a sphere like puffed out from the dust. So it's like these like little miniature explosions of clear air. <laughs> um, so there's little pops all over. Um, I think that it's like mostly quiet and like stealthy, I think. And probably like when um, when Kaio's in it, gets into the like um, the hangar bay space. Um, I think maybe that's when I break off to go and like, you know, do another part of the plan of the attack. Now that we've gotten Kaio in there, we can really let go. <laughs> and Ishikawa, you're down here in these tunnels, right? And you weren't really sure what to expect. I think that you're starting off with a lot of um sort of like abandoned subway tunnel you might expect right very occasional lights and there's you on your on your mega cycle sort of leading this pack and behind you i think that the the rebels are in these very mobile mech but they're also all kind of like it's a little bit ragtag right so i think we have some that are like um glorified like tank treads looking things. And then we have some that are more like like wolves, like mechanical wolves that are galloping along with you. And you're sort of leading this, this wild dog pack, right? Um, and then your sensors are going off and you're starting to see pings. And it's kind of weird because it's, uh, you, you don't have visual on what's above you, but you're seeing like little red dots on your radar sort of collect and your HUD is starting to fill up with like these red target reticules, right? Um, what else do we see from you as you're, pl you're plugged into this mech, you're augmented, you're cybernetically enhanced 
for speed. Tell us more about what that looks like. I, um, as he's moving along, of course, he's got the, the Gauss rifle. So um, kind of drops a little scoop that picks up a bunch of rocks and kind of works through a collector in the mega cycle to start loading up. And he's going to be firing the rocks that they have left behind while mining a little, a little bit of poetic justice. So he's going to rain down on these guys. That's the hope. That's cool. I, I kind of like that image of like this long, like metal, like arm, like going down and leaving up this big, like shower of sparks as it's scraping along. Gonna go. Yeah. Gather, yeah. yeah. Gather totally. You're, you're reading my mind, man. That sounds cool. Very cool. So let's talk about the results of our rules. Um, if we're successful, we're going to be increasing our position. If not, we're kind of in a bit of a limbo. So let's start with Kayo. How successful are you at this direct assault here? Do I need to get the answer from uh, from half the first? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, half, you said you rolled a five. Um, let's ask that question again. I think it has to do oh, with <laughs> trusting in determined determination. You're calling the shots here this round. Mm -hmm. yeah. The question is, do I trust Kyo, basically? <laughs> is he going to get the job done? Yeah. Well, are you trusting him in his determination? Oh, yeah, right. I think I'm determined enough for this. <laughs> I think yes, because <laughs> for sure on this one, because I think the whole time you were charging for and I was picking off these guys behind you, I was like, what is Kyo thinking? <laughs> if I wasn't here, he would have been swarmed by all these guys. He's just running by them. Oh, your determination? Yes, I trust it. <laughs> Very cool. So what was what was your highest die? Oh, it looks like you, with all those, you might have gotten two sixes. I don't know. Uh, I got a one six and a five. OK. Um, so on a full success, your positions increase by one. So that's popping this up to six for you. Um, yeah, and there's no there's no uh, consequence to your action. So I think that we're, just like you described, right? Um, and there's a couple moments where, you know, we, we see like this, this tramp freighter you've damaged it's one of its engines right and it's starting to kind of like lose control it's starting to spiral out um and it looks like you know we see like a, a large shipping container like sort of slide out of it that's been unsecured and you think it's about to like land on <laughs> a few workers but you catch it at the last moment then you use it to like bust up some other unoccupied vehicle right so we're seeing you kind of managing um, the collateral damage, but also dealing the kind of damage you want. Um, so since you aided, Darren, I don't think we're looking for a uh, position increase from Hafta, um, but we definitely were able to make sure there was no collateral damage at least, um, and we didn't have any damage to uh, Kyle's mech as well. Do you have something? That sounds good. Uh, I'm thinking if Darren thinks that's cool that Maybe I'm not damaging anyone, but like have just taken out a lot of people from my back who could have been shooting at me, and I just don't realize. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm doing what I want, and I'm not hurting any innocent people. And then it's just they're dropping like flies behind my back. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, I think in in this arena, you're dealing with a lot of uh, mecha that are sort of makeshift combat right you're dealing with like lifters and things like that that don't really have weapons um so you destroying them isn't necessarily contributing to your position um you're just kind of keeping these flies off of the the horse's back so to speak right i just made that saying up so there you go for free uh rich how'd you roll i got a five and another five and another five so five very very definitely five yahtzee all right, oh, that, so that is a, a mixed success. Um, so 
We're still having the, the position increase by one, which is telling me that your actions are helping to accomplish the goal. But you know, we had that mixed success with the rebel you know, recruitment. We've got this mixed success here. I'm thinking that that is, that is, in my mind, is leading to a consequence that is falling on the shoulders of the rebels. And we don't have the plans for the tunnels. So there's something unexpected coming up here. And I think it's dramatically appropriate that it's going to affect the rebels. But there's one mechanic in this game that we have not looked at at all in our entire play test. And that's the resistance role. The resistance role is an opportunity for you to sort of change the severity of a consequence hopefully in your favor you can kind of push your luck here okay um looking at that in this thing here somewhere uh scroll through luckily it's not that big a book so i can find it uh if i press Control f And click the link. Aha! It's at the bottom of page three. Uh, you have to spend one edge to make a resistance roll. And you just roll 1d6. Okay, I'll do that. No matter what, it's going to be at least slightly less severe. You won't make it worse. But let's a talk three. a little Okay. Let's talk a little bit about these stakes here, right? What we think <laughs> might be uh, the consequence for these rebels, right? So as I've laid out here, I'm thinking what could be the worst thing for you to find in this tunnel right now? That would have been really nice to know of ahead of time. Uh, some kind of sentry mech. All right, mech on mech battle sounds fun. I think something we, heavy we and stationary and is the antithesis of my little moto mega cycle right you have something that's capable of engaging you all up close and personal um but it's not quite so bad you're not dealing with the death grinder <laughs> here in this tunnel um so i'm imagining that this is um just a heavy mech right you've only got one to deal with you've got plenty of rebels to throw at them as a meat shield Okay, um, so that's the consequence. In order for you to complete this stage, you're going to have to find a way to overcome that obstacle. So um, I have a picture I can provide of what this mech looks like. One second to get you a link to it. Da -da -da. Get a shareable link. Paste it in the chat. This is what you're dealing with in the tunnel. Um. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I want to come back to that here because um, I want to talk about – take a moment to talk about time. We're here at 7.30 or two hours and 30 minutes in. <laughs> we have one stage of combat left. When that's completed, combat's resolved. We figure out what the consequences are. We discuss those, and we – go to epilogues, and then if we have time, if everyone's available, we'll do debrief at the end. So I want to wonder what ideally this combat will look like. So we might do some hard framing here at the end, right, to sort of bring this full circle. Everyone okay with that? Cool. So we're going to do another round of action rolls. Um, we're going to count up our, our numbers in our heads and, and roll as many as we think are appropriate. Um, I'll let you figure that out on your own because we've had enough practice with that already. And my thumb is tired from trying to hold up fingers and then take other ones down, and it's complicated. 
So, um, we're trying to tax Apex out of the proxy war, and we're trying to inspire these rebels to show them that they're really capable of uh, taking this into their own hands and keeping the good fight going for the good of the people and the future. So I'll just kind of ask you in turn how each of you are planning to contribute to that mission, keeping in mind that our position is now at seven. So that will probably work. If we want to get to a full 10, that's going to require individual actions from each of you, individual success to give us a full 10. So let me pull you individually. Um, let me start with, with our commanding officer, second Lieutenant Hafta. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think what I'm doing is I... <clears throat> um, I want to scale the building <laughs> to the top where I presume there is antenna and Absolutely. I want to do like a blackout. Ideally like a planet wide blackout, but I'm not gonna ask for too much. Where I just wanna like wipe out the data structures for everything. <laughs> you can always get a critical success, you know. Oh don't tempt me. <laughs> okay. So think about what it is about yourself as a pilot and how your mech is particularly accustomed to this task and figure out how many dice you think you earned there and then roll them. Uh, how about Kayo? You've taken out this nice big um, freighter. You are a rampaging bull of destruction. What do you want to destroy next? What is the shiniest thing in this china shop? Uh, let me think. You mentioned cargo. Sure. Um, I don't want to waste cargo. Let me see. Could I feasibly throw cargo away from the building in such a way that it could land like in the desert and people could pick it up later and it wouldn't get completely wrecked? Oh, I like that. You're leaving something for the for the scavengers to come and help you out with. I call it aggressive redistribution of wealth. <laughs> okay. So roll for uh, anti-capitalist protest and uh, see how you do. I'm like screaming if, the, I don't know how it goes in English, but it's like if the workers produce everything, everything belongs to them. <laughs> for sure. I, I see what you mean. We got to seize those means of production. Oh, yeah. Uh, and finally, Ishikawa, you have a heavy mech here in front of you designated Gano-1. You're probably familiar with these mech because they're probably some uh, rank-and-file you know, opposition you've faced in, in the corporate wars, right? Uh, and you know what they're capable of uh, in a enclosed space, a small tunnel, where they don't have to worry about you need to turn around quickly. And all you've got is your gas rifle and a healthy supply of very determined rebels. Think about what you want to do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's no real way to move back and fire at range, so he's just going to have to try to move, use his speed to his advantage to get in tight so that those medium range Gatling and uh, Gatling rifle and, uh, and the other like long range laser cannon are ineffective. And, uh, and yeah, he's gonna be small enough to where he can still pepper some shots on this guy, but this is really not what he's designed to fight. To you improvise. know what? I wanna call back to these, to these plays of the games, right? So you're back in a situation where you don't have the sensor lock. You have multiple people running around you that could be potential targets. You uh, are trying to make a shot in an un 
a, a less than ideal situation. You're reminded of that moment. So when you're here in the cockpit, you're going full speed. How do you cope with that doubt that starts to creep back into the back of your mind? I think the Ishikawa's method for coping is just marking off things in the catalog of what he's going to buy with all of the credits he makes. He pulls this damn thing off. I, lo I love all the all the spreadsheets that we're seeing, you know, superimposed on this. You know, we're seeing the values of of uh, Apex stock plummeting and. We're, we're, we're seeing the, the Christmas wish list here. I love it. So, Kayo, you mentioned how have to, you, you hadn't realized, had been taking out all of these uh, dock workers and, and their machines sort of without you looking. And now that you're, you're, you're pivoting, you're repositioning yourself to, to perform this action, you look around you for potential cargo, you know, valuable things to, to launch out of this pit, you're seeing some of the carnage that's been wreaked here. You're seeing, I'm assuming you're seeing dead people. You're seeing workers in jumpsuits who are smoking craters, you know, and uh, some of these things that Hafta has done, maybe inadvertently, maybe you see some people crushed by machinery, right? And that doubt is creeping back into your mind, you know, of what the sort of implications uh, of your actions could could produce. So how do you deal with that in your cockpit? I think I have pictures of home in my cockpit, like actual physical pictures. And I just like... I look at the people and you see like the anime close up on my face as my eyes are shaking like they do and, and i just like look at the pictures and i grit my teeth and i try to convince myself that these people were here because they chose to work but that's such a flimsy excuse like i don't think it even sticks to myself as i'm saying the sentence like they chose to work here nobody chooses to work over i think i'm just gritting my teeth and, and thinking like it's not a perfect world. I do this so people back home can have their lives, like they can have a peaceful life. This is my burden to care so they don't have to. You know, if, if the answer to the question, how are you dealing with this doubt is not very well, that's totally acceptable. Yeah. So, but I think it's like, it's eating away at my soul in the way it has been for a while, but I think I'm doing this for them. I'm, I'm, Sacrificing my own well-being for the sake of the of the community, and we kind of see your your hands tighten, clutch on your joysticks, right? Uh, how about you, have to Your play of the game involved um, pulling off your sort of <laughs> falling was a big aspect of yours, and now you're climbing a building. Uh, is that what's going through your head, or where, where what is the source of your doubt? Oh, I think the source of my doubt is um, <laughs> it's not falling. I think half is too cocksure to be scared of falling. But what he is afraid of, what is bringing him doubt, is that <clears throat> Knox isn't here anymore. And half is not that great of a hacker, actually. So I don't know if this is actually going to work. <laughs> mm at all <laughs> like i want to plug into an antenna and just like play top 40. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen um what are you worried i mean obviously that's gonna suck if that doesn't work how you want it to but like what are you worried about if this mission isn't a success this one you've been put in charge of <clears throat> oh i'm afraid i'm gonna get kicked out because then I'll be on my own again and I'll have to figure out how to like hide from Longinus. And it's like pretty good deal here. Although I would never tell Ishikawa that. <laughs> Very good. 
So we see this, the, the sort of the three close-ups of your faces, like come on this, like come together in this slash, you know, on the screen, right? And we all kind of have this, this varying looks. And it's all sort of tied together with this, uh, this backing sound of the heartbeat of this drill, right? Let's look at these rolls. How are we doing? Um, I think the one I'm most immediately interested in is Ishikawa's. Okay. And then I want to see how um, the redistribution of wealth is going. And then finally, from the very top of the tower, the bird's eye view, I want to see how that goes. How'd you do, Ishikawa? Uh, I didn't roll dice yet, even oh. though you said to go ahead and do a thing. So let me quick calculate. Sure thing. One for doing a thing. And then I'm going to add in sensor and hacking, but not shootist. And high speed driver. And augmentation feels about right. So, I got a six. Uh, so one success, but not critical because the next die was a five. Hand me the reins. Tell me how, or I'm handing you the reins. Tell me, tell me how this goes down. You have a complete success. Um, technically, this means you don't destroy the Gano one, but you're definitely going to be able to uh, overcome it. Cool. I think what happens is he zips in and uh, Gan fires several shots and each time uh, and we have that kind of long look, like, this is way more distance than we think it was originally. Like in the establishing shot, they were closer, but there's a longer run up. That's what happens because we're going anime. So. That's the thing. Uh, he zips back and forth with exploding rocks, pieces of tunnel, chunks, and the like. And uh, when he zips around, he actually does a quick arc around the GAN. The GAN turns, focusing all of his fire. And that's when a couple of the mechanized wolves just come and bowl it over. So it's, it's not a thing where Ishikawa blows it apart as much as he draws enough of its attention where all of the rebels are able to overwhelm it and it's not really through a great deal of combat prowess or like they're using a bolt cutter to bolt cut one of the um one of the guns and another one where they're actually like it's a it's like a bolt cutter thing and then there's another one where it actually fires hot bolts that should be used for like securing beams together and it's hammering into the side of one of the weapons and then they continue moving on and the thing could possibly be repaired, but they've overwhelmed it and moved past. And do you see the, this large gray wolf mech that sort of like makes the final blow on the shoulders to topple this thing over and its head sort of opens up like the cockpit and we see our rebel friend kind of jump out and she's got like a crowbar, right? And she says, she can't hear her because she's far away, but she's like kind of waving at you um, as, as some of her fellow rebels kind of swarm to follow you into uh, the headquarters. And we see her like jamming that crowbar into the, the cockpit of this, uh, of this model, getting ready to pull out its previous occupant, right? Uh, awesome. Uh, how are we doing redistributing wealth? <laughs> What's that looking for you? Uh, what are you throwing? How well you're throwing it? So I only rolled three dice, I guess, for diversion, infiltration, and my background. Sure. Actually, no, actually for infiltration, the, the background and the job jets. Cool. Okay, what I thought about. And I got a five out of those three. Yeah, five. Okay. Um, cool. So you're all out of edge, so you don't have an opportunity to re reduce the, the consequence here, right? Um, hmm. I, 
I'm going to save that consequence for epilogue because I don't think it's necessarily going to affect this this mission itself, right? Um, but that's definitely going to pop you up to the nine. So that's you've increased your position. Um, what do I want to know from from this? I want to know exactly. Do you know what you've thrown? And if so, what have you thrown? If you're not sure, I can figure that out. But like when you're when you're sort of prioritizing what looks valuable, what do you go to? Well, prioritizing is a, is a strong word for what I'm doing. I'm just throwing the first like any cargo is going to be a good throw because it's going to damage the company's finances anyway, and it might be something that can be sold in the black market later. So, Okay, so it's just proximity, okay. I don't know if I'm throwing bombs or if I'm throwing food. I'm just throwing it. That's what I will discuss in the epilogue. <laughs> uh, and finally, after the, the commanding officer, you have the bird's eye view, you're looking down on this carnage, uh, you're seeing these three extending like tunnels and you're starting to see like rubble as they shake and, and start to explode and and are destroyed mm -hmm. right um how well did you do with your sensor blackout and data bomb um, i got a four <laughs> if only Knox was here <laughs> if only Knox was here uh yeah so your biggest fear was um this wouldn't work, but it did. But it has a consequence for you. Um, I have an idea. Okay. <laughs> I had something lingering, but if you have something juicy, uh, throw it to me. Um, I th maybe this only affects Apex, and it doesn't affect Mirai at all, and not Administrator Walker at all, which is a big negative for me, because probably this sets up Administrator Walker to get everything she wants, and I get used like a damn pawn. <laughs> that is uh, perfect because I was going to suggest the opposite and say, "Oh, Walker's on to you, and she's going to be mad, and that's complicated." But you're right; the fact that she's not involved is even more of a sticking point for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, that means that we have moved our position to a ten. Um, so as we discuss our epilogues here, we're including the fact that this was a complete and utter victory, um, which means that both of our, yeah, yeah, quote unquote victory, right? <laughs> both, both of your primary and secondary um, objectives were met, which means that a this operation has cost Apex so much money that uh, they're going to have to halt their efforts in weaponizing the workforce. So this proxy war has ended. A, a sort of tenuous peace has settled over Eritan IV. Um, and just in time for the cargo truck to arrive, uh, if we went through the mission evaluation, I'm sure we would touch on the fact that you've done a great job of... Um, improving Mirai's income, and I think you're able to argue that the the devastation of Apex's income um, has been beneficial to them as well. So you're able to argue for a good contract. Um, Administrator Walker sends her uh, her her consideration uh, that this has all been placed on the shoulders of the rebels. Uh, for their, you know, their presence in the tunnels, um, you're able to mask your approach with a with a Gunby Collective Mecca being the sort of primary antagonist. Surely the work of some dirty scrappers, right? So you're going to be getting that bonus check. Um, you know, you're going to be off to the the sandy shores of uh, whatever the name of that beautiful planet was, right? If you wanted to, but. Um, I want to hand over epilogues to each of you, right? Let you kind of talk about where you go from here. Um, Q, 
keeping in mind that there was some some loose ends. Um, what were in those cargo bays? What were in those shipping containers, Kayo? Um, what <laughs> what has Administrator Walker? Uh, how has she offended you further? You know, th- those are the sort of things you might be thinking about. But what I want to do here, real quick, is just take a quick three minute break. Uh, step away, think about what that might look like. Um, come back at ten till, and then we'll wrap everything up. And then if people are available for more time, we can do a structured debrief. If you'd rather, if you don't have time, if you just want to send me messages on Hangouts, we can do that too. Uh, is everyone okay with that? One final break. Okay. See you in a couple minutes. I can't believe I didn't get Walker. Walker! (laughs) So, yeah, what what did happen to you? Have to go ahead and Mm. see that blog. Does anyone have one that they they would like to hold to the end or start off with? I want to. Throw that out there first as a possibility. 
Cool. Go ahead then, have to tell us tell us here. Oh man, I'm gonna have to end up. Um, I think Hafta probably tries to convince Ishikawa not to retire if that was ever <laughs> on the plate. Um, I think that that last mission kind of like shook his confidence a little bit. But I think maybe he's um, been spending more time like in contact with maybe his old gang or something back on Longinus. Um, um, yeah, maybe just to see how it's going because I think he's been thinking about that a lot, right? He like talked such a big game and then it all it went completely wrong. So I think he's been thinking a lot about like the role of idealism and uh, what like connections of people mean and like what happened to the workers who rebelled um, in the tunnels. And um, I think he's like growing up a little bit. <laughs> Captain Ishikawa, what is your epilogue? Ishikawa's epilogue is pretty quick and simple. It's him walking um, down a long metal hallway. It's not a saw hallway, so it's a long metal walk. And uh, first he's, he's walking, looking to left and right. And as it pulls back, uh, he's got a data pad and he's wanting one of those little data scrolls and he's looking left and right and he's walking along and when you pull back you see that there are mechs just lined up and he's shopping for his next mech love it at the, at the dealership let me go check with my manager about that um and finally uh one i'm particularly interested in Kayo, what's your epilogue? Oh boy, those cargo crates. Uh... So what I'm thinking is there were a whole bunch of weapons in those crates. It was just like a lot of good weapons and easy to, to pilot max. And uh, I think I see news of the planet on whatever space TV we have on our transport, on how the, what was the name of the planet again? The, the one we were just in? Eritan 4. How Eritan 4 has just become like an all out civil war between very wealthy companies and like these rebels that are just not that well equipped to do it. And they're just getting, the company just abandoned any sort of interest economic interest in the planet to just like slaughtering everyone so they can start over and like immigrate people into this planet so they can work the mines and it's just like a bloodbath it's like it's we got a whole, a whole galaxy full of workers if the if the people of this planet are too unruly it's just it's better to just wipe them out and get some new workers here it's cheaper to pay for transport than to, for re-education but objective complete it's not a proxy war anymore. <laughs> it's an actual war. <laughs> it's an actual war. Yay, we did it. War is hell. Welcome to my theme of this series. Thank you for playing into that so well. Um, yeah, but how about uh, how about Kaio himself? You know, he he had this message for for the rebel leader that he was a freedom fighter, so to speak, and that's why he was with the core was to go and do good deeds and and help people out, but. You've sort of seen what your work with the core has brought about. Yeah, I think for himself, he's going to see that it's not enough to just support the community that he's from. Because the most, the main thing about being in the mercenaries is earning money to send back to send back home. And I think he's going to come back and try to convince whatever informal council rules what happens to the community to like get involved in the conflicts. 
on Eritan Four or no, with on, the... uh, on his unnamed community that I never took. To... <laughs> Let's say the planet is called. Ah, uh, I don't know. Let's ah, so your to... hometown, so to speak. Yeah. I don't know. I'm looking at a Doctor Who poster. I'm gonna say the planet Capaldi Twelve is nice. the planet where this community is, and we just see like as the credits scroll over, we see him arguing passionately to a bunch of people about getting involved in violence and how we need to fight oppression where it happens, and that just like be an example. And then we just see him crying in whatever waiting room they live him in because it's not gonna work. Not feasible to just mess with everyone else in the galaxy. Wow, it's a real downer ending. But thank you. I'm I'm always a downer ender. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was the message of the film. Um, but I, so you know that we have the final shot of of Kaio weeping. Um, but I, I want to get final shots just of like if a close up on your face of kind of how you're feeling at the end. Let's go back to have to, you know, what, what is the sort of expression on your face? The final, uh, you know, we, we, we're going through the cast, right? <laughs> you know, voice actor, Darren Brock's like, what, um, what's the sort of final expression on have to's face as we scroll through the credits? <laughs> I think it's kind of like an irritated boredom, <laughs> like, uh, have to, is reconsidering all this stuff and it's kind of like how could i be wrong about any of this but it's also a new kind of um like it's like this new like galvanizing thing where he like is more focused in a way he's just trying to find out what that focus is and he's like over trying to figure it out <laughs> somewhere you have one of the teachers like i did in school who's like if you don't you just apply yourself <laughs> yeah um, and Ishikawa, what is sort of your parting expression on your face? Oh, uh, parting expression is we see a reflection across his cybernetic eyes of the battlefield as he's kind of commanding from a battle hammer mech and he sees like the name Hafta and Hafta's lance is, is advancing. <laughs> and he's like a proud papa, very, very excited to Hafta's telling the line. Very cool. War is hell, but it's also nuanced. <laughs> it's also profitable. Yes. And all in all, we were a family through the whole thing. Okay. Thank you, everyone, so much uh, for giving your all with All Systems Nominal uh, for this series, for really pouring each and every one of your hearts into this these sessions. I thank you so much for that. I am so grateful for you. Uh, I had an excellent time playing with you all, and I want to thank you for sticking it through to the end. So I'm going to end the broadcast now, and we will discuss how we feel about debrief afterwards. <laughs>